very much to uh, all of our speakers. We have a bit of time uh, now for discussion and uh, questions. Um, I might start with one, and then uh, any of you in the audience who have questions or um, comments you'd like to make, uh, we can start. Actually, there's a gentleman up at the microphone. Please, right, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name's Terry Slevin. I'm employed by the Cancer Council in Western Australia, and in fact was in 1996 when the Port Arthur massacre occurred. And I attended one of the community meetings that grew out of that event in the week after the massacre uh, and stood up and did my piece as a kind of public health advocate on other issues and found myself nominated as the chair of the Coalition for Gun Control in Western Australia. That experience taught me something which hasn't been mentioned today and I think should be mentioned, that was um, in the weeks of that campaign as it unfolded, uh, an envelope arrived in my letterbox at home, handwritten, addressed to me. I opened the envelope and in it was white powder um, and a handwritten note. And the handwritten note essentially said, in this envelope you will find white powder. It is harmless talcum powder. However, it is very similar to another powder which if you had it on, the fing and you on your fingers as you currently do, it would have invaded your system, it would have poisoned you, and by now you'd be dying a horrible death. Yeah. So essentially it was a threat from a gun advocate essentially saying, if you persist with your gun control advocacy, we will come and get you. Yeah. Um, and that caused fairly significant ripples through my household as we had two toddlers then under the age of four. Um, and I guess the conversation between my wife and I that evening came down to the fact that I was publicly stating positions against people who had guns at home. This generates a very personal level of vulnerability that I'd never experienced in my public health advocacy before or since. Yes. So I think it's something that's worth remembering when, uh, I guess, discussing this issue. It is a very stark reality. I suspect most of the people on the stage have had similar kinds of experience. To finish the story, as it turns out, the individual was well known to police and he was harmless and he did this on a number of issues and never actually hurt anybody, so I was never under threat. But it is a, an underlying issue that's worth putting on the table with regard to this issue. The Look, I completely agree. Mike Daub actually raised this in his talk um, uh, th this morning, and um, uh, certainly uh, I've had threats made of various kinds. Sam Lee, who's the coordinator of of Gun Control Australia um, regularly has attacks of various kinds. One of them is that people write to her employers uh, to say that this person's wasting time and, and, and uh, on the basis of no evidence at all making these statements. I've had stuff written to my university uh, pointing out that, that what I'm t talking about is uh, I know nothing about and they ought to sack me because I'm talking so and so like that. Um, you, you, you are a target and um, uh, the, the extent to which you can tolerate that depends on a number of factors, but it can get, can get very nasty. It does remind me that um, when Steve Woodward, um, who was a, a, an anti-tobacco industry uh, uh, advocate, moved to Victoria, somewhere in Rathdown Street, I think, he'd, he'd been there about um, a couple of months when a truck just drove through the front wall of the little, of the, of the semi-detached house and backed off and drove away again. And it was just the tobacco industry saying, we know where you live and, uh, and we can drive trucks through the wall whenever we feel like it. And so it's, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it's awful. And these are very powerful organisations that are cashed up and some of the people in them are very angry. Uh, I don't know if you saw, there was, there was a video shown about four or five months ago uh, of a couple of guys demonstrating how fantastic the Adler shotgun was and they had a, uh, uh, a figurine which was an image of Sam Lee from the Gun Control Australia and started ploughing um, uh, shots into it until it actually exploded. Um, and uh, you know, they, they, that's the kind of people we're dealing with. So I, I think it is an aspect that um, is, is easy to gloss over in the advocacy business, but these are nasty people. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree, because I was sitting in the office next to Rebecca Peters during that time. My name's also Rebecca. I also live close to her, and we drove to, <laughs> to university every day. And I was actually nervous myself yeah. by proxy, because I was being very close, and I heard very, very much about the threats that, was, that she, she was receiving. Yeah. I should say, though, as a road safety person, I've actually received many physical threats as well. Yeah. Partly, um, and I think it's partly the US factor. I've done a lot of work on motorcycle helmets, and there's huge resistance to that in the US. But we have violent threats about us to us whenever we publish things on motorcycle helmets, generally from the US. But 
Certainly very violent death threats coming to me when I've been advocating for young changes to young driver legislation in Australia. And it's certainly something that is there, it's resonant and it, it happens. And I have to say, I talk, we were talking earlier about why I haven't done gun control research in the past and that, that is one of the reasons yeah. why. Because yeah. I do have my hands full with a number of other unintentional injuries but you do think, am I prepared to take that on? And it, 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 it's a difficult one. Can I Thanks, have one Dan. other quick observation, and I don't want to have it about this, but as a notion economics is increasingly important when it comes to prevention and public health, and the thing that strikes me is that an economic driver potentially in the area of gun control, and particularly related to the South Pacific examples that you're providing, Philip, and that was, it seems to me that as a tourist destination, tourists going to a place that had no guns would be an attraction over tourists going to a destination that had guns. But how do we as tourists spending our tourist dollars deciding which place we spend our holiday know what the gun rates, ownership, yeah. Yeah, yeah. violence rates are in those destinations? And how can we work with the tourist tourism industry for those places that are doing the right thing to play yeah. that as one of the selling points? Because yeah. clearly the economics of the firearms industry is an enormous driver in the US and no one would pretend otherwise. But it seems to me economics surely can be better and more effectively captured in prevention, certainly more broadly. But in this issue, it seems to me to be an opportunity worth exploring. Terry, it reminds me, during the 90s, um, uh, Turkey had a, an appalling road, road, road crash rate and a death rate was absolutely terrible. And the, there was one woman, she was a plastic surgeon, who started ad, an advocacy program in there and she tried to get the health departments interested and she went to the politicians and, and went on and on and nothing actually happened. And she finally hit on the idea of going to the Department of Tourism and pointing out that if they could advertise that they were reducing the road, uh, the, the road risk in Turkey, uh, and so they put millions of dollars into uh, road safety of, in, ver in various sorts of ways. Uh, all of her money actually came from the Department of Tourism. Mm. Which, and you, you're yeah, well, the same I was just going to say, I mean, Smart Traveller, so the Australian government website does put hazards down, and I think actually we could do some lobbying to Smart Traveller to make sure that the um, risk of death from guns yeah. is actually listed on it. And we certainly do that with road, with road injury. Um, yeah. Certainly, you know, we know that places like Bali and the Greek islands where young Australians go and ride around on motorcycles without yeah. helmets. Yeah. Um, is, is shown there. I mean, the other, the other thing to do is actually to work with the insurers as well as the tourist industry and actually look at travel insurance and, yeah. you know, again, highlighting the extra costs of travelling to a place where there is high levels of gun, yeah. Yeah, like America. gun violence, like, yeah. like America. I mean, I, I am surprised, actually, that we don't have more focus on America as a dangerous tourist destination because, yeah. in fact, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And getting worse. Yeah. 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 Um, I might uh, ask a question following on from that. I I, in our th four presentations, we touched on America, but we didn't um, explicitly address the challenges in America. Um, for the panel here, what should researchers, academics, advocates start with in such a complex environment uh, as the US? Where, where do we start collecting data, uh, intervening? It's obviously... Um, a, a difficult environment, but, but for the people in the audience who might be interested in this area, where, where does one start? Do you have any thoughts? Well, I, a, a futile um, thought is to imagine that the next massacre, next gun massacre, will cause a change. I was in the United States working on gun control when Columbine happened. We thought that would, all thought that would be the, the tipping point. Then there came the next one and the next one, and 32 dead at Virginia Tech, and then there was Sandy Hook, which was a perfect example of, I mean, if 26 white, wealthy uh, children from a good neighborhood and their teachers uh, shot dead in a primary school, uh, elementary school, um, surely that should be the tipping point. But it was just the opposite, and the most, the most prominent um, recommendation in media right across America after that shooting was, we need more guns in schools, yeah. which was run by, uh, that campaign was run by the NRA. And so I think we have to conclude that it's got to get a lot worse in the United States before it gets better. 
But I think we also have to be a little bit optimistic and say, well, the solution is out there uh, when, um, if a problem is, if a problem simply cannot go on getting worse, then it must get better. And um, it may well happen after everybody in this room is dead, but the United States will eventually uh, do some of these standard public health things, uh, standard public health measures. It's just that um, ideology is getting in the way. Ideology has completely distorted the argument and the number of firearm researchers dedicated to firearm injury prevention in the United States is less than two dozen, probably only about 15, uh, who are actually committed to doing their research on this subject. Um, so it's so bad that one, the, the most active um, firearm injury prevention research center in the United States was funded by its leader who inherited some money, put a million dollars of his own money into setting up a chair uh, at UC Davis and then attracted um, state funding from California, of course, the most progressive country, uh, uh, state, arguably, in the United States. And now it's the best funded firearm injury prevention research center in the United States. But it's getting no help from uh, federal funding. It's, as Joel said, it's, that is prohibited, that is written out of the mission statement of the two most prominent federal research funders uh, for purely political reasons, because the NRA pushed that um, in the 1990s and it became law. Well, not law, sorry. It became, no, it's not law. It became part of the mission statement of those two outfits. So, it, as I say, I, I think it's going to get a lot worse, uh, but here in the Pacific we have the perfect opportunity to continue going the way that we're going and to see what's happening over there as an object lesson in how not to do it, just as so many uh, other countries in the world feel the same way. And here hi. I hear an, an American accent about to approach the microphone. Yes, hi. My name is Dr. Stephanie Biasi, and I am involved with a group called Moms Demand Sense for uh, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And it's a, I'm from Midland, Michigan. We have a small group and we're trying to make an inroads in, in policy. It's a, a not partisan basis and we're looking for gun sense. So putting your locks on the guns and having the guns separate from the ammunition and training people on how to safely use guns and things like that. But we need to have more people be aware of that organization, I think. and maybe more um, news about it uh, globally, besides just being in the United States. And yeah, actually, during the, um, during the election campaign, um, every town, which is a, 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 a widespread um, gun control organization in the United States at, at community levels, ran uh, a, a, a lot of advertising, in particularly in some key, in some key centers. And, and uh, it's very, very slick stuff, and they had a number of uh, important celebrities supporting them and so on. Do you follow their stuff, Philip? Yes, uh, I should have said that there is something very heartening going on in the United States at the moment, and that is, that, as I say, I started working on this in the States uh, many years ago, and I was amazed at the amount of infighting and the amount of squabbling that went on between the various groups, gun control groups. Nobody could agree. You get one group saying, well, we've got to ban plastic guns that are being sold to children at Christmas, uh, and another saying that um, vaguely racial messages, uh, anti-racial messages. Um, there, there are all sorts of different, and nobody could quite agree. But now here in the United, now in the United States, everybody seems to, almost everybody seems to have coalesced around one or two very important policies. And one of those is background checks, which of yes. course the rest of the world has had for 30 or 40 years. Um, and the background check movement is, uh, has had more force than any other major policy plank in the United States. And that is a standard public health procedure. Um, so it's good to see 
agreement amongst some groups, amongst most of the groups, and I think there is hope, there is mileage, there is um, energy in the United States uh, groups which wasn't there, was dispersed a few years ago, and is now seemingly coming together. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, the Bloomberg Foundation, which is uh, a, a private foundation set up by uh, um, the mayor of the former mayor of New York, who started the Bloomberg uh, business, uh, has put about a hundred million dollars into g grassroots activities like Moms and others. To, yeah, every town is the, uh, the the website that people can go to. And so there there is an effort to try to create this kind of bottom up. Uh, response because, as you know, Congress has cut off any money to the CDC for doing any research on violence prevention, uh, and the NRA is constantly um, trying to stop local communities. In fact, they reward uh, congressional people or state people. The, one of the state representatives who uh, is in the district next to ours has received all kinds of gifts and prizes from the NRA, and he's now a, a strong proponent for allowing guns to be in all the public schools in Michigan, for instance. And this is his, this is his cause. This is what he believes will make uh, America safe, whatever. But I just wanted to add something else. And maybe, you know, we see this as a, as a national issue that has no national co coalition of any kind. There's maybe for one reason or another been a lack of uh, coming together. And, and in Australia here, you, you seem to have been able to get the, the right people, as you said, the ingredients together. And I, and I do agree that the, the time will come when that will happen in the United States. But the kind of event that will take place will have to be one that has a direct impact on uh, more than just uh, school children and people who are remotely uh, a part of the, the, the American culture. The, the legislative people um, are have a, turned a, a deaf ear to this whole matter. And unfortunately, and here's the real challenge, public health is the only solution to this problem in America and maybe in other countries. And we have found from our own experience of working with some of the public health agencies, they don't want to touch this. Violence is one of those things that they see as a criminal justice issue, not a public health issue. And so, in the schools of public health, I think that what has to be introduced, and this is going to take some time, is a whole idea, a new idea that violence is as important as vaccination or anything else, and it will take a generation probably to reach the point where, and, and I think that's what's going to happen in America. We're probably a generation away uh, from actually being able to be sensible about this. And the other thing that will happen is the many of the white baby boomers who currently possess guns and prize them will be dead. And their children don't really want guns. So I think that there's gonna be that shift, but it's, it's a long time coming. Good point. Um, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's a fantastic point. And I think we cannot shy away from the fact that inequalities within American society is driving a lot of this. We have a, a sort of undercurrent of disenfranchised people for whom violence seems to be a solution. And Weapons are there at their disposal. They're not going to give them up easily. Then we have the combination with the NRA, which is really well funded, and then we've got a really fatal um, combination there of two very powerful sort of forces coming together. And I think we have to address that. We have to address inequality and 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 those young angry men. And really, that's all old angry well, men. I don't know who they are, but in America, it is mostly old white men who are angry who have these guns, who don't want to give them up. Uh, and I know from my own experience, they, they feel that they have a strong um, right to those guns. And, uh, you know, they're not going to change their attitude anytime soon. Yeah. And they're the NRA members. They're the guys driving around with pickup trucks with an NRA sticker on the back of the pickup Absolutely. truck. Absolutely. Um, I think one thing I should say, though, is we do also need to remember that the very powerful force that Mothers Against Drunk Drivers were in the US yes. in actually changing drink driving legislation, actually shifting, supporting <coughs> government changes to legislation and the shifts in community attitudes. And, mother, you know, coalitions of mothers, um, of, you know, yeah. mothers whose children yeah. have been killed yeah. are incredibly powerful lobby groups. So well done. I think yeah. it's a fantastic coalition. Yeah. From, from the Thank perspective you for of, comment. of um, the element of your question regarding schools of public health, 
Uh, I think perhaps a lens that we should be using more is the social determinants of health, which some mm -hmm. of the panelists yeah. mentioned, um, and focusing on inequality, focusing on um, poverty, um, and using that as the entry point to a discussion about violence. Yeah. Um, as a head of School of Public Health who is very involved in curriculum development, it, this is a challenge for us, and I think it's one of the reasons we wanted to have this session, <coughs> was to highlight that we do need to talk about violence, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's injuries, whether it's um, gun violence, and this does need to make its way into core curriculum, and the points have been made that it's seen as scary and political, but so is pharmaceutical access, so is tobacco, mm -hmm. so is road traffic. There's lots of core public yeah. health. I mean, if public health starts being scared of topics, well, then we're no longer public health. Mm -hmm. We're, I don't know what we are. Yeah. So people who enter into the field of public health need to be, and I think are, willing to take on some of these challenges. Um, but we as leaders in our schools of public health need to forge a way for students to have that opportunity, and that's, that is a challenge for all of us. Question here. Uh, hi there. Um, so I just wanted to share a story which I think t um, refers very much to what you were just talking about there and what Rebecca and Charles both mentioned about the social determinants of violence. Um, I'm a public health registrar in WA, but one of the jobs I've previously worked in um, was working with, um, in cl clinical forensic medicine here in Melbourne. And in my job, um, I was called to go and assess um, people who'd been arrested um, by the police and to assess their fitness for interview. Um, during my, well, just six months there, I was called to, while I was on call, called to see two men who'd, who'd been arrested for murdering or allegedly murdering their partners. Um, and on the drive to see these people, every time I, I remember thinking, I, f I felt quite fearful about meeting these evil people who've killed, potentially killed their partner. But when I actually walked into the room to assess them, the overwhelming feeling I actually had, which I was really surprised by, was actually of, of pity. And it was just looking at their faces and seeing that absolute shell-shocked horror of the fact that they had actually, you know, the situation had happened. And it was at that point kind of understanding the, what had led them to that position and the drug and alcohol issues that they clearly, you know, just looking at them and assessing them to see if they could be interviewed, you could quite clearly see how they were still drug affected. And I think, yeah, in my mind, that really cemented the fact that it's not evil people grabbing guns, killing people. That's just such, so many things that lead to that point. And yeah, I, I just found, for me, it was a real turning point. And it's very much that, how do we address those social determinants of violence? And in some ways you feel the money actually needs to go into men in a way in that you know in domestic violence situations that's where funding needs to go but obviously never never will go but that's just my point that's just i mean it, it's absolutely true and i think it's such a that i mean that that is the truth of it really i think that and that's where we do need to focus but i mean that's also they're also the big issues tackling tackling mental health tackling education tackling poverty drug and alcohol use. I mean, we can talk about drug and alcohol use, but we also have to tackle why people have got addiction issues. And again, it comes back to inequality and poverty and you know, early childhood trauma and, and so on. They're, they're big picture things, but we can't shy away from them. But again, it, it does also sort of bring us back to a systems approach and saying we approach it from all angles. We have strong legislation about access to firearms. We have, you know, problems for addiction. We, we look at inequality. We look at all aspects of the issue we put, and we, we do have to look at what's cost effective. And I think when, when we come back to saying, well, what are the key research questions that we ask, whether they're for Australia or whether they're for the US, we look at the cost, the, you know, the, what is the cost of gun violence to the community? And, but what's also the cost, cost effectiveness of interventions? Legislation is actually relatively cheap um, because if it's applied well, um, and, and enforced well, but then we do have to look at a range and we do have to look at the social determinants and we have to look at the social context and we have to invest there as well and we can't shy away from those big picture difficult issues as public health professionals. But at the same time we have to look at the, the one critical um, factor which is availability and 
this is why it's so difficult to approach this problem in a country that's already saturated with firearms. Australia was getting, was becoming saturated with firearms, uh, with privately owned firearms, and nobody really realised it until the figures started coming out from the public health community and the police and justice community to show how many firearms there were in the country, and people were absolutely horrified by this. Um, and that's why the reaction, uh, the one of the saddest and most common um, features of uh, gunshot perpetrators in domestic violence is that a very, very high proportion of them report immediately feeling terrible remorse, feeling, oh my God, if only the gun, if only I hadn't had that trigger to pull, if only I hadn't had a gun and with loaded with ammunition at the moment, I would not have killed my wife or whatever. Now, that's not universal, of course, um, but the instant lethality of the firearm and the availability of the firearm and its ammunition uh, are being tackled in Australia by locking firearms in a separate container to the ammunition, uh, by making it difficult to actually get to that point of anger and, and uh, also critically in suicide. Uh, and those are absolutely public health, uh, public health priorities. It, the irony is that the United States just uh, forged this huge global reputation for public health initiatives which reduced major tolls. Look at the road toll. The, the curve was going up dramatically in the 1950s. Everybody got concerned about it. The, the industry did the standard thing, which was to deny and to say it's the nut behind the wheel, they said. In other words, blame the driver. Um, and then along came Ralph Nader. And the whole, uh, the whole argument was flipped on its head when Mothers Against Drunk Driving moved in. And guns and cars have two things in common. They are symbols of masculinity and symbols of freedom. And reducing access or reducing the potential of a symbol of freedom to kill in the, in the, uh, the case of a car, that was absolutely, everybody acknowledged that was a really good thing. Uh, eventually, the, the gun will face exactly the same procedures and people will still own guns. People will still be free. People will still be masculine and it won't affect anything in the end. But one point that you, you, point, you pointed up a few moments ago was the, the possibility that a generation might die out and another one come in with better attitudes. Now, I think that's largely wishful thinking. Um, and I've been around long enough to see a couple of generations come and go. Um, and I don't think that is going to make the big difference, but one of the things that does make a big difference, and this is the, the single most reliable indicator of gun ownership in the United States, and certainly here as well, is that your father owned a firearm. That is the single most reliable way of, of working out whether a person has, is likely to have a firearm. And if uh, what we see now, in both, as I showed you, in both Australia and the United States, is that the number of households with firearms is dramatically reducing in all wealthy nations. But the number of people, the number of guns in the population as, at large, and the number uh, uh, is growing. And there's this tremendous contrast between the people who already have guns buying more, had 10 last year, now they're getting 15 because Obama is threatening to take away semi-autos as they imagine, or as the NRA is telling them. They wouldn't have the courage to do that, but um, it's, it's always the threat that the NRA runs in its magazines very effectively. Um, but this, that will make a change, and eventually, um, eventually the number of households which have firearms will get lower and lower and lower. At least that's my optimistic hope. Phil, what, what we haven't talked about, though, and I think it's critical, is actually what kind of a risk does 3D printing pose to us in terms of gun ownership? In law, zero, because any manufacturer of, a, a of anything that could qualify 
Any 3D printed gun immediately becomes a firearm under our legislation in all sta states and territories, and that becomes illegal to make it. So the law is already quite adequate to deal with, uh, with 3D guns. Also, the tests that have been done with 3D guns show that there is much danger to the person who fires them as they are to the target. Um, no 3D gun has ever been made that has more than a single shot action. All of, in fact, they have no action. They're simply capable of firing one very low caliber bullet, like a .22. If you put a, a .38 or uh, something larger into a 3D gun, then your chances of blowing your hand off are very, very high. Um, 3D technology simply hasn't reached the point where it's a major threat. Um, the advent of more sophisticated 3D technology will certainly change things when we are able to produce metallic, um, uh, print metallic guns out of uh, using a 3D printer. But that's a way away yet. And still, it is, we are still at the ridiculous situation where police forces whose commissioners have said, oh, we've got to worry about 3D guns, um, send off their firearms experts to test a 3D gun and they take the most stringent precautions. They won't stand anywhere near the damn thing, let alone hold it and aim it, uh, simply because they're so flimsy. So there's a lot of hype about 3D guns, uh, which is not justified. Last question. I I'm sorry to have a second crack at the, uh, at the cherry here, but nobody else is asking questions, so I will. Um, what strikes me about the entire conversation, we're now almost two hours, is nobody's talked about big gun. Now, we've seen the quote... Sorry, talked about what? Big gun, the industry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen the quote from Margaret Chan, who talked about big soda, uh, yeah. big food, uh, big alcohol. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about big gun. I mean, we heard Bronwyn King talk about the tobacco industry and chasing them out of our pension funds. Yeah. But the notion, surely it's self-evident to anybody who thinks about this for 90 seconds, comes to the realisation that this is a power relationship which is about maximisation of profits. And there is a yeah. firearms, multi national firearms industry about which I know nothing. I've got no idea what the names of the companies are. I've got no idea who's running the companies. We've yeah. talked about, you know, Mike Dobbs personalised the, the problem. Identify the people who are making the decisions to create this infrastructure that funds the NRA, that funds the, the dodgy politicians. Yeah. And I haven't heard word one about that. It seems to be absolutely, as a mosquito is to malaria, the firearm industry is to gun violence. It's true. I mean, um, I, there, there, actually in the New Yorker over the last year there have been a number of articles really about the industry and what they're up to and what they're trying to do. And um, you're absolutely correct. The, the amount of money that they're capable of pouring into the NRA, uh, making sure they get what they want, and the amount of control they have over policy when new uh, gun... There's a lot of argument in the United States over the fingerprint uh, uh, security thing that uh, as to whether you should have that. And it's being controlled by the gun industry who are trying to work out will this be better for sales or worse for sales, you know, kind of thing. Because if you can introduce a new kind of gun uh, and that adds to sales, that's a good thing. Um, but if, on the other hand, um, uh, someone uh, uh, something actually reduces interest in guns or whatever, then you don't do that. So in the same way as the tobacco industry uh, works, they're, they're always interested in uh, how much they can sell and so on. And they are huge industries, just absolutely massive, the, the, the US. Of course, internationally, the armaments industry is pretty massive in other countries too. There's one town in, Ger in Germany that makes a huge amount of the small arms uh, that, that come out of Europe. Um, for example, do you, do you know the story of this? It's, it's, it's well, uh, Anton Glock and, and Glock, yeah. Heckler and Koch both yeah. have their, uh, their manufacturers quite close. But the, once again, there's a lot of um, misapprehension about this, and that is that somehow this is some great, uh, huge industry. It's true that the arms industry is a yeah. huge industry. Yeah. Um, that Raytheon and British uh, Aerospace and the, big, the world's biggest um, armament makers are huge and they have colossal um, resources in terms of public relations, but the domestic arms industry, the small arms industry, the people who make guns uh, for, to be handheld is a tiny industry and the pr public health community could overthrow them given a, a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of um, support, 
in a very short time. There are only two publicly listed country, uh, companies making small arms in the United States. Here in Australia, we have no arms industry to be, uh, no small arms industry, no, no handgun and, and uh, rifle industry to speak of. We have a factory built in World War II which can still make a few guns, and they do for the, but it's mainly defense force contracts. And so it, it is a ridiculously small target, the, the gun industry in the United States. Certainly they give a few million dollars here and there to the NRA. They're becoming more and more active. Nobody's gonna change their minds. The Anton Glocks and the, uh, the people who run the 38, uh, Smith and Wessons and so on, the people who run those gun industries are absolutely immune to any form of, um, of persuasion in that regard. Let me uh, assure you, I've, I've talked to them. Um, and it, it, I think the, the thing that is going to make the difference is if the public health community puts the same pressure on the industry uh, as they once put on the road traffic industry and the, uh, the, the automobile manufacturers and the tobacco industry, both of which are colossus compared to the, 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 uh, gun, the manufacturing industry for small arms. So I think there is hope and uh, I certainly hope that we'll get some support for that kind of movement. If I could do a final word or? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank Great. You. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists.